Okay. Hello and welcome to the special AGU webinar titled Geology and Game of Thrones Part 2, featuring our guest speaker, Preston Jacobs. I'm Eric Hankin, the Student and Career Programs Manager at AGU, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Uh, you do not need to have seen Part 1 of this mini-series in order to understand today's presentation, but you can access that recording by going to the AGU webinars website, webinars.agu.org. Presenting today is Preston Jacobs. Preston is an analyst and performance auditor for the United States Department of State and resides in Germany. In his spare time, you can catch Preston's thoughts on Game of Thrones episodes and the Song of Ice and uh, Fire books, um, where he'll discuss different theories about the books and what's happening in the show on his very popular YouTube channel, Rereading Ice, Rethinking Fire. Today, he'll share his thoughts on how geology has impacted the Song of Ice and Fire storylines and some geologic questions to ponder as both the TV and book plots continue to develop. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Preston. Preston, take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Preston Jacobs, and I'll be your speaker today. And we'll be talking about geology and Game of Thrones. Um, now, many of you may be wondering, you know, if geology is really part of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. After all, this is a story about zombies and dragons that appears magical. But I would argue that, in fact, George R. R. Martin did think about geology at least somewhat when inventing this universe, at least as a layman. And so that's what we'll be discussing today. Um, and so before we start out, I'd like to have a little poll um, uh, just to get sort of where everybody feels about, uh, you know, how much science is in the story. So, um, Eric, maybe you can... Uh... Yeah, so here's the poll question. First one right off the bat. In which genre would you categorize Game of Thrones in A Song of Ice and Fire? Do you consider it to be a fantasy story? Oh. <laughs> okay, we have a, a misprint in the poll, and that's my fault. It says fantasy story twice. If you think it's a science fiction story, choose option B. <laughs> um, if you think it's a fantasy story, choose the first option. If you think there's no difference between fantasy and science fiction, choose number three. And if you're not cho sure, choose number four. Starting off strong. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll close the poll in three, two, one. Closing the poll. Okay, 46% uh, consider it to be option A, a fantasy story. Uh, next highest is there's no difference between fantasy and science fiction. And 16% think it's a uh, science fiction story. All right. Now, there's a reason why uh, I asked that question, and a lot of it has to do with the background of George R. R. Martin. Um, he has a background in writing and journalism and chess and teaching, but his career is mostly uh, about writing science fiction stories, and this is kind of important because George R. R. Martin, he's no scientist and he's no expert, but he still appreciates science, and he still appreciates making things scientifically accurate, and if you were to actually ask him if there's a difference between fantasy and science fiction, he would say no. But um, I'd like to show you uh, a couple, couple pictures here. Um, now, in the uh, upper left-hand corner, we have a George R. R. Martin dragon. And in the lower right, we have a traditional dragon that you might see in popular, popular culture. This is uh, you know, the cover of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the old role-playing game. And if you notice, there is a big difference between them, and that is the George R. R. Martin dragon has no arms. He just has wings, while the traditional dragon has arms and wings. And, you know, this is biology, but it, it shows that George R. R. Martin is paying attention to science. Uh, in the real world and all of history, there's been no creature that's had four limbs and wings. Birds, pterodactyls, bats, they all have two legs and wings, no arms. And so our author wanted to be scientifically accurate when portraying fantastical dragons. And so, you know, this kind of shows that our author, he, you know, he's a layman, but he has an appreciation for, for science because he has a science fiction background. And so that's kind of where we're heading with the story. Um, and so I'd first like to ask a, a kind of basic question. How old is Planetos and how did this come about? And this may be this may seem really basic and unimportant, but our plot, see, you know, our plot seems to involve you know a fight over monarchy and the invasion of White Walkers. But really, when you ask this question, it cuts to the heart of everything. Much in the way, if you ask this question about our Earth, it cuts to the heart of everything. 
And when I say that, I mean it reveals how we approach and examine the world. Um, we have a historical and legendary way to look at our Earth, and we have a ge you know, geological and scientific way to look at our Earth. And keep in mind that on our Earth, you know, these are very different stories. Um, our Earth, legend and history, says that the Earth is thousands of years old and was created by a god in six days via divine magic, while geologists find that the Earth is billions of years old and came about through natural scientific law. So here on Earth, there's a significant disparity between legend and history and geologic truth. Um, and so I should mention that other fantasy stories like Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings, if you were to ask this similar question, how old is Middle Earth, there's no disparity. The legend is the literal truth. A god called Yuvatar, uh, using divine magic, created Middle Earth thousands of years ago before Frodo came along. Uh, he moved the continents, he created the sun and moon, he created life. It's a, it's a creationist tale, and that's all there is to it. And we're not supposed to question these facts. There's no, there's no hidden secrets. And, you know, looking at science, it may be fun, but it doesn't reveal anything about Frodo, his friends, or the story at all, because the author, J.R.R. Tolkien, wasn't considering geology or science to any great extent when he, uh, when he created the story. And so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is Planetos, is it like Earth, where geologic truth is the real truth, or is it like Middle Earth, where histories and legends are the real truth? And so I'd like to jump um, and talk about a major historical event that you guys may know, and that is the coming of the first men uh, to Westeros and their war with the children of the forest. And so for those who aren't familiar, the continent of Westeros was once ruled and inhabited by the children of the forest, and the first men invaded 12,000 years ago, and they warred with the children, and according to Maester Lewin, the Green Seers used dark magic to make the sea rise and swept the land away, shattering the arm of Dorne here. And, um, and so, you know, we have humanity crossing over a land bridge, sea levels rising, breaking this land bridge 12,000 years ago. Now, if this seems a little familiar, uh, there's a reason for that, because, you know, we have our own Earth and we know that uh, uh, there was a land bridge in between Asia and the Americas. And, you know, people, people figure that around 12,000 years ago, humanity passed over this land bridge in a, in a, in a window in between, the, you know, when the glacier was there and it receding and when the sea levels rose in order to, to make the trip impossible. Um, and so we have this direct parallel that, that our author is making with, with time and, 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 and how things function. And so, yes, like our author is a layman, and, um, but we can see this parallel. Now, a geologist may say, okay, it's, it wasn't actually 12,000 years ago, but you have to remember that you know, our author wrote this in the 1990s and he's not gonna get everything exact. Um, some geologists think that this crossing happened, you know, at 11,000 years ago or 13,000. Some there's a lot of arguments over this, but you know, our author's a layman, so he says 12,000 years ago this happened. Um, and so, you know, this is the larger point. There, there's a parallel between Planetos and Earth. We have a, migra a migration and inundation. The time periods line up, and so. Even though there's this magical explanation, on Earth we have a geological scientific explanation for the same thing. So we don't necessarily need a magical explanation on Planetos when the scientific one works. Um, and so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, did the children of the forest really use dark magic to make sea levels rise, or did they break to break the arm of Dorne, or is the arm of Dorne simply inundated due to rising sea levels accompanying the end of an ice age? Um, so, and Preston, so I think this is time for another poll question, right? Yes. Okay, let's bring that up. So how do you think the arm of Dorne broke? Uh, the natural end of an ice age? The children of the forest magic? Um, climate change, either uh, caused by the children of the forest or caused by humans, or are you not sure? Love to hear from you all. Please select your choice, and we'll close the polls in three, two, one. Closing the polls.
All right, and it looks like the overwhelming answer, Preston, with almost 60% is the natural end of an ice age. All right, so maybe I'm being persuasive. Um, now, we may never know the, end, the, the real answer to this. Uh, our author may never reveal it, but I think our author is trying to at least make the parallel and make us question things. Um, and he does this a lot, actually, and, the, and these aren't geology related, but um, in our story we have things like, in, in A Feast for Crows begins with uh, people getting magically resurrected on a beach, but if you pay attention it might actually be mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation awakening these people on a beach. Or, for instance, the character of Kyburn is kicked out of the Citadel for necromancy, opening bodies of the living, but is that just surgery? We have that in our world. And, you know, Daenerys, when she goes into the house of black and, or the house of the undying and she has visions, she also drank Shade of the Evening before that. Are these really magical visions or are these psychotropic drugs? And it's we don't have the answers, but I think our author wants us to question it. He wants us to be critical. And so I'm gonna bring up another parallel uh, to our world, and that is the fall of Gis. And um, for those who don't know, Gis is the empire that eventually becomes Slaver's Bay. Um, it's uh, where Danny comes in and conquers on season three and lives there all the way through season six. Um, it's the home of the cities of Marine, Yunkai, and Astapor. And um, Slaver's Bay is a kind of has-been society. It was once great. It was once the dominant civilization on Earth. It was called Gis. And then there's the question of why did Gis decline? And Danny claims that it happened 5,000 years ago, that Valyrian armies sacked the cities and their dragons burned everything and their fields were sown with salt and sulfur. And that's a colorful story, but it doesn't really make any sense uh, when explaining the decline of a civilization. Gis didn't collapse all at once. It, it occurred over hundreds of years with multiple wars. The cities have clearly been rebuilt. Um, not to mention, there's the question of salting fields and sulfuring fields. We hear about this in, with Rome salting Carthage's fields after the Third Punic War, but we actually don't have any evidence that salt makes tracts of land unusable in the long term. In fact, Carthage was pretty prosperous after the Third Punic War, and salting wouldn't poison land for thousands of years. I mean, there's this thing called rain, and salt is pretty easily soluble, and it would wash away. And as for sulfur, sulfur is actually good for crops. And so, you know, even if we set aside the ridiculousness of the story, if the Valerians and their dragons were supposed to be the problem for Gis, then why didn't Gis rebound after the Valerians all died, which happened 400 years before Danny arrives? And so history and legends fails to really explain why Gis declined and stayed that way, but it turns out there is a good geological answer for this. Um, and that is, it has to do with bronze. Um, now, in our story, Gis, and actually this big uh, harpy of Gis, is made of bronze. And that's actually, you know, a literary uh, reference that uh, Gis was an empire of the Bronze Age. It, it had pyramids. It's a stand-in for a Bronze Age society. Um, and we know that bronze is made of both copper and tin. And as we see in the, the periodic table, uh, tin is actually a pretty uh, heavy metal. Um, it's relatively rare on Earth. The, the heavier a metal generally, the rarer on Earth. It's certainly heavier than copper. And this is kind of a big deal as bronze has a 7 to 1 ratio of copper to tin. But on Earth, we only have a 25 to 1 ratio of copper to tin. And so, and actually Daenerys specifically tells us that Slaver's Bay is rich in copper. And we learn from Tyrion that they actually import tin. So tin is rare in this world. It's getting imported. They don't have it in Slaver's Bay. And so from all of this, we can actually kind of deduce how Old Gist society functioned. They had the copper. They were a bronze-oriented society. They would rapidly consume their own tin, and so they would need more tin, and they'd need to import it from, from the outside. And so if we actually look at the map, this is where we actually hear about in the yellow, we hear, this is where we actually hear about tin existing in the world. Slaver's Bay is here at the green. And so there would actually be a tin trade. Um, it would either go around Essos or down the mighty Rhine River. 
And the big thing is it all goes past Valeria. And so Valeria could actually disrupt this tin trade and that would be a major problem for GIS. And if this all seems familiar, that's because it did happen in, in the real world. Um, our Bronze Age collapse, which happens in 1200 BC, occurred largely because of the scarcity of tin. The Middle East, um, the Greeks, the Hittites, the Egyptians, they needed more and more tin for, and, uh, for their bronze. And so they established trading routes to Western Europe. And then the Sea Peoples disrupted this trade route, leading to the Greek Dark Ages and the collapse of the Hittite Empire and the receding of the Egyptian Empire. And so after this Bronze Age collapse, people looked more and more to iron, which is something that's much lighter than even copper, and it's 800 times more common, in fact, than copper. And thus we saw the birth of the Iron Age. Um, and so with this, 5,000 years ago, the collapse of, of the Bronze Age in Essos, we also have another kind of parallel because this is when the Andals invade Westeros and the Andals famously have iron. Um, uh, and they famously fought the first men who had bronze weapons with their iron weapons. And so we have this, we have this again, a, a parallel to our world where the Bronze Age begins at 1200 BC, the Bronze Age collapses at 1200 BC, in Westeros, it happens 5,000 years ago, but uh, we have a, a similar situation where our author is connecting um, geology and history. Um, and so I'd like to check again if, uh, if I'm being very uh, convincing. So it's time for another poll. So I'll hand that over to Eric. Yeah, let's queue up the next poll. So why do you think Old Gist collapsed? The disruption of the tin trade? The wrath of the dragon lords, um, the rise of the Iron Age, or are you really not sure? We'd love to hear from you, and we'll close the polls in three, two, one. Closing the polls. Okay, Preston. It looks like forty percent think it was the disruption of the tin trade. Thirty-one percent think it was the rise of the Iron Age, um, and only nine percent think that. Dragon Lords played a major role in all of this. Ah, so I'm being a little more convincing. Um, so the, uh, I'd like to return to the question of whether the world is operating via magic or science. Is this like Middle Earth or regular Earth? Because so far, you know, I've showed some examples where geology uh, can, can you know, sufficiently explain major events, such as the coming of the first men in the fall of Gis, just like geology explains the first Americans in the Bronze Age collapse. And so I would argue that Planetos seems to be operating like Earth, at least geologically. Um, and so I'd like to talk about as well, because the option is, are we looking at geology, are we looking at history and legends? Um, can we really trust history? Because generally in our world, the further back you go, the less certain we are of events. And there is actually a scene in the book that happens twice um, this is at the end of the fourth book and the beginning of the fifth, or beginning of the fourth and beginning of the fifth book, um, both told from different perspectives, Sam and John, John's. And Sam uh, tells us that the oldest histories were written down well after the Andals came to Westeros. The first men didn't write down anything except for runes on rocks. And so everything that we know about the Age of Heroes, the Dawn Age, all of these things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago were written thousands of years later by Septons, and there are Archmaesters of the Citadel that question it all. Um, and so, right now, even the characters in our story are questioning history uh, and the veracity of it. And so, still, let's ask, let's look at some other questions of how old is Planetos? Let's get back to this question. And so, if we ask the Maesters, they actually themselves have varying opinions. So uh, an acolyte named Lazy Leo tells us that uh, an archmaester named Pariston thinks that the world is 40,000 years old, and another uh, archmaester named Malos says it's 500,000 uh, 500, uh, 500, years old. Um, Pariston, we know, is a historian, uh, so at least histories he thinks go back about 40,000 years. Malos, I don't know, but he, I'm guessing he might be an archaeologist uh, for, for that kind of number. Um, we do have another testimony on how old the world might be, 
and that is from the children of the forest. And they claim they've been in their cave for a million years. So maybe the world is a million years old, or a few million. Um, but if we're actually going to geology, and again, this world does seem to function somewhat like, it, like geologically, like our Earth does. If we go to geology, the planetos is at least hundreds of millions of years, if not billions, year, uh, billions of years old. And the largest uh, evidence of that is the presence of caves everywhere. Um, the caves are pretty ubiquitous in our story, uh, perhaps the most famous being the cave that John and Egret have sex in and the cave of the three-eyed crow or three-eyed raven in the show. And these caves, caves are, fam are uh, formed from the dissolution of limestone over the course of millions of years, millions and millions of years, and limestone itself is formed from the buildup of dead marine organisms like coral and mollusks over the course of millions and millions of years, usually in tropical reefs. And so if we look at our map, this is the location of known limestone deposits in our story. And you can see that there's quite a bit of limestone um, around Cracklaw Point. This is uh, Brianne's story where she goes up and down into the Riverlands. Um, and then John, north of the wall, comes across quite a bit of uh, quite a few caves up there. There's some caves around Winterfell and in the north. And then Ariana, Ariane Martel, uh, runs into some caves down down in uh, the Stormlands. Um, but if you notice, these are these locations, especially the ones north of the wall are nowhere near uh, reefs, tropical reefs. And so in order for a limestone to get up north, you'd have to have millions and millions of years of limestone formation in a tropical reef, and then millions and millions of years of tectonic movement to get it up north, and then millions and millions of years of dissolution to get that cave formed. And so the big question is, who cares? Okay, there's caves. Well, the point I'm making is that Planetos is a very, very old planet. It's, it's like our Earth, and unlike Middle Earth. And so, and the history we've been, be, been given can't really be trusted. Um, and so for the most part, considering that the Planetos is at least hundreds of millions of years old, we know it has a mostly unknown past. Even the children of the forest claiming a million years old is just this tiny sliver of time. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what was going on in Planetos in this entire unknown past period? I mean, did they have dinosaurs, um, trilobites, things like that? Um, and we don't know, but we do have some very, very weird things that, that uh, point to a very unusual history. Um, and briefly, I'm going to get into these. Um, we have petrified ships. And uh, we have a couple of examples of these. Uh, the first is in Sunspear, where the Martell seat. They actually live inside a petrified ship called the Sand Ship. Um, it's actually, it looks like a giant drummond that's washed ashore and turned to stone. Uh, we know that the Martells are an Andal house, and so they've been living in the Sand Ship for at most 5,000 years. But before that, we have no idea where the structure came from. Um, so, this is where the sand ship is located, uh, near the Arm of Dorne again. It looks like it was turned to stone, um, but we, it's just a large mystery on why this stone petrified ship would be there. Um, and this is just one of them. There, there's perhaps another one over in the Iron Isles. Uh, and this one is called Naga's Ribs. And um, the locals actually don't believe it's a ship. They believe that it's sea dragons' ribs turned to stone. And though sea dragons don't exist in our story, they're currently not a thing. Maesters question whether they ever existed. Uh, like the sand ship, they're compared to Drummonds. They both turned to stone. They're both kind of near a flood zone. Um, we know that they were both used as keeps at some point. Um, and so, yes, the, it might be an actual ribs, petrified ribs of a giant whale, but people have noted that it could be the skeleton of a ship under construction, um, that ribs uh, look very, very similar. Now, it should be noted that neither one of these ships are near anything like a thermal spring that we would normally associate with petrification. So in order for these ships to be petrified, you're talking about a process of millions and millions of years 
Um, and so seafaring people for millions and millions of years ago really throw a wrench in our narrative of children of the forest and then first men and then Andals. Um, we have a couple other things that are really weird and perplexing. And that is one odd thing about Westeros is there aren't any volcanoes. At least we don't hear about any except on Dragonstone. Dragonstone's the closest one. Um, and yet, uh, there's a place called Moat Kaelin. Moat Kaelin is famous for, this is where Theon convinced his own people, the Ironborn, to, uh, to surrender. Um, and they were all flayed. Uh, it's a very, very important strategic castle in the neck. And oddly, it it's, uh, has an enormous wall made of basalt out of huge bricks. Basalt is uh, famously a volcanic rock. These huge bricks are the size of houses. Um, they used to be part of a big giant wall. Even ignoring the fact, even ignoring the uh, the question of how these things were transported, you know, where did this basalt come from when there's no volcanoes in Westeros, and how was it transported here? And there's one more odd thing that really throws a wrench in the story. This is where the uh, Moat Kaelin is, and then and the last thing that's really odd are these black oily stones. Now this is mostly a book thing, but um, there are some odd black oily stones that. Uh, exist all over the world. Um, the uh, some in some in far off places, some in the Iron Isles. But the most famous is actually in Old Town, with Sam. It is the base of the High Tower. The High Tower is this incredibly large tower that's been in the city, and at the base of this High Tower is this oily black stone, um, which means because it's at the base, it means it predates. Uh, the founding of the city and the arrival of House Hightower and the first men, which is 12,000 years ago. Um, who created this black stone is, uh, is a mystery historically. Um, it's black, it's oily, and it's been there longer. It predates all known civilization. And so I guess I'd like to finish up with this large mystery with, uh, with our last poll. Um, so I'll hand this back over to, uh, to Eric. Yep, I'll load up the last poll question. And we want to know what you think the black oily stones are. Do you think it's some sort of oil sandstone, uh, serpentinite, meteorites, or to really throw a wrench into things, could it be plastic? And this is another George R. R. Martin post-apocalyptic world that we're uh, currently living in. So we'll uh, close the polls in three, two, one. Okay, we have a nice mix here. So meteorites went out with, let's see here, 32%. 28% think it's plastic. So we got some post-apocalyptic people here. 27% um, oil sandstone, and only 12 think it's serpentinite. All right, and that is, uh, that is all I have. So um, some food for everyone to think about. Uh, and so let's open it up to uh, some questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Preston, for that awesome presentation. Um, if you have questions, you can type them into the question box. We've got a couple that we'll start off with, um, and we'll get to as many as we can. We have a fair amount of time here, so feel free to ask as many questions as you like. And please remember that Preston is not a professional geologist, so <laughs> if you've got geology questions, um, don't make them too intricate. <laughs> so first question here, Preston, um, from Sam is did George R. R. Martin ever call his world Planetos, or is this something that uh, came out of, came from the fans? No, it's, it's the fans. Um, he might be using it now, but it certainly never appears in the books. Uh, it was a, a fan-created uh, thing, just because there's a continent called Westeros and a continent called Esos and a, another one called Ulthos and Southeros. So they just thought, well, if Os is added to everything, I guess it's Planetos. But, um, I mean, they, they, the people in the story call the planet Earth, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fan-made uh, name. The, I'm sure George R. R. Martin has used it on occasion, but only because the fans invented it. Okay, here's, a, here's an intricate one from uh, Mathieu. He asks, um, what do you think about the theory that a meteor destroyed the Arm of Dorne and started the Long Night? Um... Well, I mean, we definitely have a sea levels rising, and I mean, even the history tells us that that sea levels have risen. 
So yes, you could you could throw in a a meteorite striking, and that might move out move away some land. But um, there are other places on the planet too that that show um, that sea levels have risen uh, around the Thousand Islands, around around um, the Iron Islands as well. Actually, Moat Kalen as well. Um, it, the fact it used to not be so marshy. Um, so it's not that there couldn't be a meteorite that struck it, but there's no need uh, when the Arm of Dorne could break um, with rising uh, sea levels. Um, so I mean, it's certainly something that's possible, but I'm, I'm, if, if one accepts that there, that there are ice ages and that this is a parallel for uh, uh, the Bering Straits, then it's not necessary. Um, but you know, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing in the story that says it didn't happen. So to add on to that, um, Anna Victoria points asks if a meteorite could also mean uh, that this world is post-apocalyptic. Um, you know, this could be the the possible cause of an apocalypse. Yeah, I mean, the world is definitely post-apocalyptic. The the question is, what kind of apocalypse was it? Uh, like we know that that there were some great societies in the past and you know things are now uh, not as advanced. I mean we know that something built the wall and something built Storm's End. They were more advanced in the past. Um, even if you know even if you believe in magic, maybe they were more advanced magically, but the point is, you know, the people the people now the people have gone backwards, either scientifically or magically. Um, so the question is, you know, is it may even be that there's been many little apocalypses because we do have the long night, which is supposedly 8,000 years ago, but then we have some other, you know, destructive events that, that seem to be happening that people claim is at, you know, 12,000 years ago. And then, the, um, you know, the doom of Valeria happens 400 years ago, and that's a mini apocalypse, or, or hard home happens 600 years ago, and that's another kind of apocalypse. And then there's Karth. Karth clearly went through something. Um, there's clearly climate change there that turned that environment from, uh, you know, a, a habitable ecosystem into uh, a desert. Um, so it's it's tough. I mean, it could be that all of these histories are off, and that there was just one single apocalyptic event, and everyone's been shifting around the uh, the time period. Um, a meteorite. It's, that's certainly possible. Um, might be something natural. It might be a nuclear war. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of different ideas. I don't know if we necessarily have uh, enough information, but uh, you know, I, I'm I'm one that I'm one that says nuclear war, but you know, it could be it could be it could be a lot more actually. So I'm not sure. Okay, so speaking of winters, but not nuclear winters, um, John has the question: Do you have an explanation for the, uh, you know, whether geologic, scientific, or just your own postulation for the very long irregular winters? Are they just mini ice ages? Um, and if so, what do you think could be causing these? Well, I definitely, I definitely think that our author has thought about. Um, uh, Planetary tilts and orbits. He has he has a lot of science fiction stories uh, that take place on planets with irregular winters and irregular orbits. Um, he has one called Bitter Blooms, where there's irregular winters, winters that last for years. Um, uh, another one with a stone city, where the characters from from a planet with irregular winters. So this isn't this isn't the first time he's done this. Um, so he's thought about these things and he's thought about irregular orbits, things coming back into, into play hundreds of years later and affecting things. So, um, and I also know in interviews he claims, oh, it's magic, there's no explanation, but I think he's being a little disingenuous when he says that. Um, so, I mean, I think he's just thinking that there's, perhaps, I mean, it might be that a comet came by or, or something knocked the Earth off its tilt to cause things to be a little irregular. Um, uh, people have said that you know I'm I'm no um, uh, astrophysicist, but the uh, or or but um, you know this seems like something that could happen that that it's just simply a, a irregular planetary tilt that somehow happened, perhaps from a meteorite, perhaps uh, from some massive explosion on the planet that uh, that caused things to to get out of get out of whack. 
Okay, so I'm like we've got a lot coming in. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Um, so Orr asks, you know, this world seems to be in some sort of endless war. This world, so Planetos and, you know, the, world, the people that we're introduced to seems to be in some sort of endless war. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, I mean, this is going to sound a little crazy, but um, I believe uh, mind control. <laughs> the, uh, so George R. R. Martin has a lot of stories about aliens influencing people with mind control, uh, putting in bad ideas, visions, dreams, uh, to cause people to, to fight themselves. Uh, I think that, you know, in our story we know, especially the, the, written, the, the book story, that not so much in the show, but the, our characters are constantly plagued with dreams, and they constantly make really weird decisions after having these dreams. Um, one example that you may know is, is Catalan uh, blacks out. Um, it's a really weird, weird scene where she just blacks out for hours and then wakes up, and then she decides she's going to let Jamie go. And a lot of people you know, look at that scene and say, oh my gosh, that was really crazy that Catalan let Jamie out of, out of prison and just let him free and trusted him. This is a guy who tossed uh, her son out a window. Um, but she just does that. And, and a lot of people are baffled by, you know, why she would do that. But also there was something very odd going on with her brain right before that. Uh, there's a story called um, And Seven Times Never Kill Man, which is perhaps the... the the best example of this where uh, a group of uh, humans land on a planet and then the leader starts having strange visions and then he starts making really bad decisions and they end up burning all of their food and at the end of the story everybody, uh, well spoilers, everybody, everybody starves at the end. Um, so I mean you gotta think the children of the forest, they were killed off by humanity and in our story Bran questions that. He says, huh, this is really odd that man killed off the children of the forest and they aren't doing anything about it. You know, man would be wroth, is what he says. And so I wonder if the children of the forest are doing something about it. If they're sending really bad ideas, you know, dreams, things to convince us to be religious zealots, uh, things to convince us to go to war over the Iron Throne, to fight amongst ourselves and, and, and kill, kill each other. So it, it sounds crazy, but yeah, I, I think the thing that's, that's keeping humanity in the Dark Ages for thousands and thousands of years uh, is, is bad dreams. <laughs> so I don't think this is his real name, but Euron Greyjoy has a question I think is a good follow-up to that. Um, how do you think this story will change if the characters ever find out that their history is all wrong? Huh. I mean, the question is, is how can they find that out? And the only, the only way they'll ever really find that out is to, is to um, I guess, find a really, really old artifact. But the problem is that artifacts, um, you know, decay. Or perhaps this stuff is recorded in, you know, the werewoods. Um, I, I think if, if, if humanity does discover this, you know, I think it would be a, a beneficial thing. I think they would they would realize that they made these bad bad mistakes in the past, and that um, you know that that uh, they need to they need to give peace a chance. Um, it should be noted that George R. R. Martin is a huge hippie. He was a conscientious objector. Uh, he he did not uh, participate in Vietnam. He instead did volunteer work with Vista, which is like uh, AmeriCorps. Um, he he is he is most if not all of his stories are are uh, anti-war in theme. And so, yeah, I mean, I hope, you know, if, if humanity discovered this, they would, they would realize their mistakes uh, and, and perhaps try to, you know, put down their swords and make peace. Cool. Um, switching gears, and actually, Miles touched on this at the very end of last week's uh, webinar in the Q&A, but I'm inter interested to hear what you have to say, Preston. So Nicholas wants to know, what do you believe caused the doom of Valeria, and were the Valerians direct, directly responsible? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, now, I read Miles' theory, um, and he definitely he points out, uh, for anyone that didn't uh, read it or, or see his presentation, that 
uh, a large volcano would not have enough force to essentially sink the entire peninsula. You, you'd need a volcano that was, you know, a thousand, uh, many thousand times bigger than any volcano that's ever been on Earth in order to do it. Um, and if if you had a volcano like that, you'd you'd have massive um, uh, global impacts everywhere else too. Uh, and so he theorizes that it was a, a meteor impact thousands of years ago that, and then history just kind of got confused and, and everyone was saying that Valeria was a peninsula when it wasn't. Um, I think that there might be something geological going on underneath the earth. I think it is very curious that there's no, there's no volcanoes in Westeros and the earth has so many tunnels and so many caves. Um, every major castle has a major tunnel system underneath it. Um, and so I, I do wonder if this other society, if there was a futuristic society in the past, um, an advanced society in the past, if they relied on geothermal energy and had massive networks of geothermal um, you know, lava flowing different, different places, and if they were using this energy somehow. Um, one of the things I really, quite, I, I really ask myself is, what is making the wall um, stay around? Because that doesn't happen naturally. You would need some sort of power in order to refrigerate and re-refrigerate the wall. Um, something is going automatically in order to keep that together. And even if you say magic, well, it's some sort of magical power that's keeping the wall uh, together, not sublimating, not, not falling apart. And so I do wonder if beneath the earth there are large geological mechanisms, uh, machinery, um, and I do, you know, I wonder if the Valerians had tapped into some of these and, and didn't know how to handle them and, and you know, perhaps uh, they broke down. Or if many people point to the faceless men, um, they, you know, they were slaves underneath the Valerians and that it was all a massive sabotage. And I, I would say that that's quite likely, um, that if, if the Valerians did have a, a great underneath, uh, underground Ge uh, geothermal power society that uh, perhaps these slaves sabotaged their mechanisms and, and caused a, uh, a large enough explosion. Um, what, you know, one that could be a thousand times more powerful than a volcano. Interesting. So uh, help me here, Preston. Um, sure. I'm not <laughs> as much of a, uh, a book geek as, as you or some of the other um, audience members, but um, do we have evidence of strange season timing and weird years before the Doom of Valeria? Well, we have no records, so we don't okay. know, um, you know, what happened. I mean, as, as far as, as far back as, as at least the Maesters, I imagine it's before the Doom of Valeria. The, the Maesters have been recording history, I guess, when, when the and Andals arrived. So history goes back about 5,000 years, and so the Doom is 400 years ago. So I would be pretty certain that, that irregular seasons go back at least as, as far as maester history. So I'd say that the Doom of Valeria is probably not the thing that caused the irregular seasons. But, um, you know, it's possible that we had regular seasons at some point, or maybe we never had regular seasons, but um, I think it's, it's older than 400 years. Okay. Because an impact, I mean, some planetary scientists may correct me immediately on the chat board here and say I'm, I'm crazy, but forgive me, I'm a hydrologist. Um, but an impact could, at least in the eye of George R. R. Martin, have knocked both the tilt and the orbit a little out of wonk. And that could have been the impetus for giving us these crazy seasons that we see. On yeah. Planet Toast. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to the audience questions. I'm just having fun as host. <laughs> 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 so... Um, Okay, recent spoiler. I, I don't think this is a spoiler, but thank you for um, being uh, conscious of that, Robert. Robert um, points out there's dragon class under Dragonstone. Um, is there a volcano there, or do you think this was dragon made, and hence the name? Uh, no, I mean, Dragonstone definitely was volcanic uh, before before the dragons kind of got there. Um, uh, the the the, the only came to Dragonstone 400 uh, right before the Doom, um, and so they didn't they didn't create the volcano. So it's one of the few volcanoes, the closest volcanoes 
you know, if you think Dragostad is part of Westeros, I mean, it is an island off the coast, but it's the only volcano that we know about in Westeros. Um, there's some question of whether or not the, the lake in the middle, the God's Eye, was a volcano and became a, a caldera, but uh, we don't we don't know of any other volcanoes other than than Dragonstone. But yeah, I think it was naturally a a volcano, and so and that they, they the Targaryens purposely went there because they could. It's good for hatching dragon eggs and such. Okay, so Eric's got a really interesting question. It's a two parter. I'm going to try merge it into one. Um, yeah, so we you pointed out that George R. R. Martin, while not a scientist. Um, you know, he's, he's a layman in terms of science, but he still obviously cares about science. Um, since science has changed even in the last 20 years and access to information with the web, yada, 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 will, um, do you think George will adjust or include some of this information in his final reveal in the series, um, even if only as clues for those who are looking for the science story and not the mythical story? So do you think our, our author will adjust the plot in any way to... Um, include any advances that we have in, in science since he started this series? Yeah, I do. I mean, he, he claims that he doesn't, I mean, he says he knows how, the, how, the, how everything will end, but he doesn't have much detail, you know, many details on uh, things in between. Uh, he claims that he gets bored if he knows the whole story. So yeah, I think that anything that, that, he come, that comes along, he'll, he'll try to include. Um, and he, he's done that somewhat with, not with science, but he's done it with politics. Um, it's tough not to see a bunch of parallels between uh, Danny in Slaver's Bay and, say, our, you know, the American adventures in Iraq. Um, and, you know, that, that's, you know, he added fairly contemporary information in, in, in that. And so he does do that. Um, so, I mean, I, I could see him throwing in something to do with, you know, more recent science if he comes across it. If, he, if he's still reading up on it, I, I imagine he is. Cool. Um, so Elias wants to know, what's up with the red waste? Um, and how likely or unlikely is it to be natural? Ooh, the red waste is a super, super huge mystery. Um, nothing about it really makes sense. So if you go to Karth, Karth um, has three walls. The innermost wall is marble, the uh, middle wall is granite, and the outermost wall is sandstone. And the drawings on the walls are the innermost wall has people having sex, the middle wall has people uh, you know, having war, and the outermost wall is uh, scenes of nature. And so at first glance, as you're heading into the, the, uh, the, the uh, city, you kind of say, well, okay, you start with nature and then you have war, and then the last phase is um, luxury, modernity. And that seems logical at first until you say, well, wait a minute, why is the innermost wall the modern one? Like, you can't build walls inward. Like, that wouldn't make any sense. You'd have to, like, demolish buildings. Uh, it'd be really impractical to do that. And then the other weird thing is, wait a minute, you have both sandstone and granite and marble? in a massive amount, like in the same area, like geologically that's kind of ridiculous. Did they import all of this granite, like enough to build an entire city wall? That's just a lot of granite. I mean, um, and so everything is kind of a contradiction. People from Karth are super, super pale and yet it's the middle of the desert. Usually people in the desert, you know, tend to be darker in complexion. Um, and so I definitely, you know, I think it has something to do with climate change. Um, I would guess that the Carthene were subterranean at some point, and that's why they're pale. They were living underground, perhaps during a, an apocalypse period. Um, and then they came out, and their, and their land was, was, you know, a desert. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard to say because there's, it's, it's one of these places that I've just, I've scratched my head so much because nothing really makes sense about it. But it's pretty clear that climate change happened there. There used to be nature and now it's a red waste. Um, and nothing else seems to make sense about the society. We don't know if they're progressing or regressing in technology. We don't know if, uh, you know, or maybe they, they, they regressed and progressed again. Um, we don't know why they're pale. We don't know where these stones came from. It's, uh, 
it's a big mix up and uh, I suppose you know I suppose intentional from our author on that it's maybe not supposed to make sense just to make us question everything right going back to the whole uh, maybe it's apocalypse maybe they're repressed yeah gotcha um, so a couple of people have asked about you know the last slide that you show, the, the black oily stones, and I'm going to read Diego's question. He says, how do you feel about the oily black stone found all over the known world? Do you think it may be from uh, pre-children of the, of the forest? Also, how, many, how may it relate to other continents we've yet to see? So, um, it's interesting. The, so these black stones, they, they mainly show up in the, uh, in the book that only, only the nerds bought, which is the World of, the world of Ice and Fire. And it mentions that these these black oily stones are on you know the in Old Town and and the Iron Isles, um, and yeah, I think it's to point out I don't, I think it's to point out that history doesn't make sense certainly that you're that you're having this somewhat advanced society all over the world that predates all of the other ones, um, and it's definitely to show that 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 our history is is wrong, um, but it's a uh, um, and then the fact that it's of a substance that no one knows what it is, I would almost lean. To, I would personally lean lean to the plastic, saying that oh, these people are are advanced. Um, and so, could they actually predate the children of the, the children of the forest? I I would say that yeah, there's definitely um, I'd say there's definitely a chance of that. Um, especially if you're talking about petrified ships, you have a massive you know, if you're talking about seafaring society from millions of years ago, I'm not sure if they're the same society that built the, the oily, oily stones, but um, it's all to point out that, you know, none of this history is supposed to make sense. He's purposely throwing a wrench in everything and saying, you know, every, these things are in contradiction. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard to have answers because there just aren't any good answers. Um, so the another another thing that I think it's u used for is so if you read this book uh, the world of ice and fire they they also have a bunch of parallel situations around the world where people are fighting creatures not like the White Walkers but enemies um, there's a place called the Five Forts that's made out of this black oily stone and the Five Forts are up against the desert. And they're fighting, you know, demons that come from this desert, and you know, this is clearly a parallel to the Wall, um, where you know, an ice, you know, people are keeping out this enemy. Um, but we don't, we don't actually have to go that far for these parallels. We can go to Cracklaw Point where Brienne explored, and we find the Squishers. And again, like we have this society facing facing these weird uh, meta humans that are, are, are demons or enemies um, coming from the sea. If, if I were going to have a unifying theory about everything, I would say that, okay, whatever disaster happened in our past, uh, there were elements like mutation, um, evolution, perhaps genetic engineering, that would unite all of these stories between sort of the demons at the five forts and the squishers and the white walkers. You know, something that made, you know, if, if the Earth had this massive climate change, perhaps human beings needed to evolve or change themselves uh, with genetic engineering in order to live better on this planet. Um, and so that's kind of, that would be my guess on what's going on, that the others are human beings, the White Walkers are human beings, and, you know, if the whole world is falling into, into winter, maybe the best thing is to genetically engineer yourself to to live better in, the, in that environment while other humans went underground and other humans went into the sea and other humans went into the desert or something and you know ch and changed but um, it gets into you know it's a lot of, it's a lot of crazy out there talk I know but uh, it's it's not it's not too off the mark from other George R. R. Martin stories but that's where I think the the oily stones kind of go that there was this old society that's advanced that fell and then humanity from that from that older society changed into into all of the creatures that we know today i feel sorry for anyone that just joined the webinar cuz they're probably like <laughs> oh my god what's going on <laughs> so i'm i'm going to shift gears from from black things to red things 
Um, Anna here wants to know what she asks, um, Preston, what's your take on the Red Comet? Ah, the Red Comet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, George R. R. Martin has a lot of science fiction stories about celestial objects that uh, are not actually celestial objects. You know, they're, that they're actually spaceships or, you know, um, they're actually uh, uh, space-faring aliens. And so, for a while I was making this joke that the, the comet is a Vulcran, which is the space-faring alien from a George R. R. Martin story called, called uh, Night Flyers. Um, and in that story, uh, the space-faring space -faring alien actually propels itself across the, the galaxy using telekinesis. And as he passes different planets, people's telepathy and telekinesis abilities go nuts. And he actually claims that this creature passed Earth around the, around the time of Christ, and therefore he's implying that, you know, Jesus' miracles were actually all telekinetic, you know, abilities caused by this Vulcran. Um, I don't know if it's that, if it's an alien, but uh, I'm willing to accept that it's perhaps something that could enhance people's um, telepathic abilities or magical abilities, you know, if, if, if you just want to go away from the sci-fi, um, that perhaps the comet is something that, that uh, is stimulating people on the planet and, and making them, uh, making, uh, you know, th them wake up a bit. Um, I mean, keep in mind that you know Daenerys was able to hatch her dragons when this comet came, and was able to perhaps protect herself from fire, you know, in a in a perhaps pyrokinetic way. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's not a, maybe it's a coincidence, or maybe it's just all magic and it's not meant to be explained. But George R. R. Martin has another story where something in the sky enhanced telepathic, telekinetic abilities, and, you know, it's, you know, that sort of thing happens at Danny at that point. Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to say if, if, if he's gone into that much detail, but I do think there's significance to it. Um, so, I mean, maybe, maybe it's a big spacefaring alien that enhances telepathy. Maybe it's a spaceship, um, but uh, I, I don't think it's a comet. Um, I think that would be too boring. You know, I think it's something else. I mean, you know, whether it just be something magical in the sky or, or a spaceship or an alien, I think it's something besides a comet. Okay, we have, like, tons of awesome questions, and there's no <laughs> way we're going to get to all of them in two minutes. So, um, Preston, quickly, I, would it be okay if people contacted you on, uh, on Twitter or through your, your YouTube? Sure. I don't know if you want to share that out loud. Sure. I mean, uh, I've got my YouTube channel, um, which is just Preston Jacobs. If you're in YouTube, uh, I have a Facebook page, uh, Preston Jacobs, the Sweet Robin. I have a Twitter account, which is um, uh, Preston Jacobs at Sweet Robin Nine Thousand. Okay, and then we'll we'll end with a question Michael has because it's kind of portends to an end anyway. Um, Michael asks, "Will killing the Night's King end the long night?" And if so, how can that be explained? Uh, I mean, I don't think so. Um, but, uh, I mean, unless there's some sort of, you know, really strange magic to it all, I don't see how the law, I don't see how the killing a single, you know, individual could, could affect um, the entire world. I mean, unless he has some sort of massive... Tele, you know, telepathic, telekinetic connection to the to the seasons, but uh, that's that's a bit much. Um, I mean, what's funny is we don't actually have any evidence that the long night is coming. Everyone says that the long night is coming, but you know, do we have any evidence that it's coming? No, it's just it's winter time is coming. I mean, so you know, that's the that's the one thing I do um, question about the series is that. You know, on our Earth, uh, there's plenty of doomsday uh, zealots out there who claim that the doomsday is coming. And, it, you know, by doing so, it almost causes more harm than, than, than good by, by claiming that, you know, the end is nigh and, you know, as a battle cry. And so I do question, you know, whether or not John's battle cry to stop the Night King is really helpful. I mean, 
has the Night King really done anything that's been too aggressive? Eh, maybe, maybe attacking hard home, you know? But he hasn't crossed the wall yet, you know? We've been the aggressors. We've gone into their territory and, and uh, attacked them with Dragonglass and are, have been arming ourselves with Dragonglass, the human side. Um, you know, so maybe, he, you know, maybe they're just uh, defending themselves and maybe there is no long night coming and uh, just, a, just a, a regular winter. Um, it's hard to say. Or, or maybe the, the Night's King just knows the math and knows the history and knows when the, night, the next night, long night is coming just on a natural earth tilt kind of way. But I see no, no reason to think that he has, a, has some sort of magical or telepathic connection to the whole world like that. But. Unless he's the final Horcrux. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll see myself out. <laughs> with that, Preston, uh, it's been an awesome webinar. Um, thanks for, for geeking out with us, and thanks to all our audience for, for geeking out. It's a fun little... Yeah, I went, I went full tinfoil on, on yeah. this one with the questions, yeah. Um, you know, we've had some people ask this, but we will be sending out the, um, the link and a follow-up email to watch the recording, and our plans are to put both part one and part two on YouTube. Um, we'll need to clean up those recordings a little bit, um, but look for that at the on the AGU YouTube channel uh, sometime next week. Um, Preston, I don't know if you have any parting words. No, no, just uh, thanks everyone for uh, stopping by and listening to me ramble. Yeah, thank you, Preston, and thanks everyone for joining. Have a great day.